again, and it's a pleasure having here the opportunity of this dialogue with uh, uh, the Foreign Minister of uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Javad Zarif. Uh, welcome to Rome again, I should say, to Med. Uh, Mr. Zarif, let's start with the, an overall view about the region. I know it could take like a couple of weeks, but uh, let's <laughs> say in a few minutes, let's try to understand what's the situation in your region in this moment seen from Tehran perspective. Well, first of all, good evening to everybody and it's good to be back. Um, and thank you for, for inviting me. I, I believe our region is suffering from both internal as well as external uh, sources of challenge and, and pressure. Uh, the internal ones, uh, and these are interrelated. We cannot blame the outsiders for everything that we have, but the outsiders are not totally without blame. Uh, we have faced intervention from outside uh, for a very long time, and for very wrong reasons. Uh, there has been a problem of understanding in our region, and that is why the choices that have been made by the outside world have always led to consequences that have been detrimental for our region. Everybody in the region knew that the invasion of Iraq by the United States would lead to extremism. Only the United States believed it would not. Everybody knew in our region that the situation in Syria would lead to disaster. But, but some people from the outside believed that they could topple Bashar al-Assad in three weeks. Uh, as the saying was, by the end of Ramadan. Uh, and it's been seven Ramadans since then. So wrong choices from outside. We see some of those wrong choices right now. And internal dynamics in the region. Uh, lack of democracy, uh, failure of state system in our region to respond to the minimum demands of the population, be it economic demands, but more importantly, demand for integrity and dignity, which has been uh, not met, uh, and also uh, what leads to uh, lack of cooperation in the re region. And let me put it in, in a uh, simply couple of words. The belief that you can purchase security from outside. I think that is the fundamental problem in our region. So if I want to summarize the problem, the external problem is wrong choices. The internal problem is believing that you can rely on the outside for your prosperity, for your security, and for everything else. I stayed within limits. Yes, <laughs> We're going to manage it. Yeah, no Good. Minister, um, next April, the um, Islamic Republic of Iran will celebrate its uh, 40 years. And I would like to be back to 1979, which is a very important year, because that year there was a creation of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. There was a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. There was a siege at Mecca. And there was a Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. So in retrospect, in your views, what was the most uh, transformative event among the ones I have just listed? Well, I think all of them have been important, but certainly for us in Iran and for the Islamic world, uh, the fact that you could, in fact, resist a superpower and not fail. Uh, unfortunately, uh, today, President Trump makes a statement uh, which hurts me, at least, that if he does not support some of our neighbors, they would not last for two or three weeks. We have shown that in spite of the United States, not only without its support, but in spite of the United States, we have survived, not only survived, but prospered and thrived for 40 years. I think that's very important, and that's very important to look at today, particularly when we see a lot of attempt to pressure the entire world by an administration that unfortunately does not see any utility in following international law. You referred to, to the US, but um, in my view, this year, 1979, that's also the beginning of the big competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia. 
So how could you describe, you know, at the time being, the relation you have with, uh, we have not, with Riyadh and its consequences for the regional balance and more broadly for the global balance? Well, uh, unfortunately, there has been a misperception uh, by our neighbors looking at Iran as a threat. Uh, and that misperception has led to a number of disasters. People do not want to remember that we were the subject of eight years of war in which Saudi Arabia spent 70 some billion dollars, according to their own sources, uh, arming and supporting Saddam Hussein. But two years after the end of the war, less than two years after the end of our war, uh, he turned the guns that they had provided to him, the Saudis and the Kuwaitis, against them. Uh, invading Kuwait and targeting Saudi Arabia. So, again, it's the matter of wrong choices that have been made. Following that, they supported Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, and you see what happened. And again, wrong choices in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, elsewhere. And you start with the wrong choice, you end up with the wrong result. And you cannot blame anybody for that. Are we to blame that they armed Saddam Hussein to attack us and then he turned his guns against them? Is that, was that our fault? Why is it that everybody wants to look at these problems of their own creation as Iran's fault? Sounds to me like the tweet you made a couple of days ago in which you said that uh, you're expecting President of the United States blaming you of California fire, fire. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we didn't rake the forest <laughs> like the Finns. But, Mr. Zarif, you were uh, speaking about security and security provided from outside to inside. So let's go back to the situation in Tehran these days. Um, JCPOA, uh, the nuclear treaty which is uh, at stake, and let's see where it is going to, to go, and we're going to be in-depth in this later on. But uh, which is the reaction in this very moment in Iran after what happened to the uh, nuclear treaty and what we can see as a, an economic problem coming from far and, and still here? Well, I think uh, what is clear is that we have a good deal. It's not a treaty, but it's not just an agreement between Iran and the previous administration. It's, a, it's an accord that was reached between Iran, P5 plus one, uh, EU, and then was uh, enclosed, enshrined in a Security Council resolution, the longest Security Council resolution. And if nobody has seen a 100-page Security Council resolution. So it's not just an agreement, according to President Trump, that he can abruptly withdraw from. It is a part and parcel of international law. Um, although he doesn't find it very difficult to violate other norms of international law, he withdrew from a treaty with Iran uh, that was even ratified by, by the Senate, uh, and he withdrew from the Paris Convention, all other things. Uh, so that has been framing by the United States in a way that this was uh, just a paper that was uh, agreed between two administrations. So the outcome in Tehran is that less reliance on engagement. Population believes that engagement did not provide the intended results. I think the Iranian people will, in fact, come together and live through the sanctions. We've lived through more difficult times. Again, I want to go back to the Iran-Iraq war. We lived through eight years of war when the Iraqis were supported by everybody. The Soviets gave them MiG fighters. The French gave them Mirage airplanes. The Brits gave them chieftain tanks. The Germans gave them chemical weapons. The Americans gave them AVAX reconnaissance. The Saudis gave them $75 billion of arms. The Kuwaitis gave them their ports. Everybody chipped in to support them. And we were just out of a revolution. We survived. Not only we survived, we made progress. We advanced. We will do it again. But our people will see less and less possibility of relying on the promises that are made to them. 
and I think that would be very difficult for the international community. I think something else is also important. I, I, I want to draw a picture of what is happening. There is a Security Council resolution. That Security Council resolution, which was sponsored by the United States and unanimously adopted by the Security Council, calls on every country to do everything to help implementation of JCPOA and not to do anything that impedes its implementation. And what is the purpose of JCPOA? Two pillars. First pillar, Iran should remain, Iran's nuclear program should remain peaceful. Second pillar, Iran's economic relations with the rest of the world should be normalized. Now the United States is not only violating the resolution itself, but it is asking others to violate it. And it is punishing those who want to stick to international law. This is something that is happening right now. So if you want in, in Europe to allow this to become a precedent, then tomorrow the United States can come and ask Europe to do something else that is illegal or to do something else that is against the interest of Europe. I think that should be the precedent that Europe should decide to prevent. Iran will survive. We have survived in the past. We will survive in the future. But will it be possible for the international community to sustain this vicious attack on the global order? That's a question that you need to answer. Uh, let me just stay for one second on this because I would like to insist on something. Yes, you explained to us that Iran will survive as one if attacked from outside. Crystal clear. But uh, if I remind well, uh, in 2005, for instance, the economic crisis led to a political crisis and to a very strong political change. Are you afraid that this time the economic crisis and the pressure from outside could have not an impact when it comes to Iran reacting to outside, but inside Iran on the political uh, balance that we have now? Well, you see, we are proud to rely on our own people. That's, that's how we have survived. If we did not rely on our people, we, we, we didn't have anybody else to rely on. Our people will make the determination. Now, the only time that our people made a determination was not in 2008 or 2009. Remember, go back to 2005. The Iranian people went to the polls, and although I didn't like the outcome of the polls, but they elected somebody in response to the fact that the previous government, which opened up to Europe, was not able to uh, deliver. So these changes in the political climate in Iran is just normal. It happens in Iran. It happens in other democracies. Of course, when you do not have, uh, you do not have to worry about people's votes, then you do not have to worry about these policies. But in Iran, fortunately or unfortunately, we have to worry about people's votes. And people react to these developments. In the past, they have reacted to this by electing a very conservative government. They can do it again. They have also reacted to them by, re by electing a different type of government. So these developments that take place in Europe, similar developments take place in Iran. And we, I mean, uh, just like the elections in the United States. I mean, uh, <laughs> what, what should I say? <laughs> Minister, since the beginning of our conversation, you have insisted many times that Iran has survived since 1979. Um, survival is one thing, development is another one. So in terms of development, what is, from your perspective, the most important? Is it for Iran to be integrated in the world economy, or is it to pursue a very assertive regional policy, or maybe you can think that it's possible to do the two things simultaneously, but I would be glad to, to have your elaboration on that. Well, we haven't survived since 1979. We've survived for seven millennia. <laughs> 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 we, 
You see, uh, I'm in Italy, so we can, uh, I can say... You can compare. Yeah. I can say <laughs> Italians and Iranians have had empires that has lasted more than the entire life of some countries. <laughs> so we're not, we're not easily impressed by that. So we've survived and we have progressed. You see, if you come to Iran today, you see that we have made progress in many areas. Of course, we lack in some areas. There has been pressure on Iran. There are problems, uh, economic problems. There are economic hardships for our population. Sanctions, as you know, always target ordinary people. At the end of the day, those are the people who suffer from sanctions. And that is the purpose of these sanctions. That's been the purpose of the previous sanctions. And we've been under sanctions for 40 years. But does that mean, and that point that I made about the depth of our history gives us this perspective that we should not submit to bullying. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to make a choice. It's not a dichotomy. Look at our region. Who's more secure than Iran? Who's more stable than Iran? I just saw a map uh, that was published by, I guess, a French agency about where is, where is it safe to go as a tourist. And the only country in the region that is as safe as any country in Europe is Iran. No other country in the region. We're safer than all other countries to visit. Why is it? Because we chose to rely on our own people. And I think, I mean, I'm the person uh, who is known in Iran as a pro-engagement person. But at a split, split of a second, I will decide to go for our independence rather than for anything else. And I think that pays. At the end of the day, it has paid. But we want to engage. And you mentioned about region. What have we done wrong in the region? Did we support Saddam Hussein? Did we support the Taliban? Did we support Al-Qaeda? Did we support Daesh? Did we support Al-Nusra? Did we try to strangulate Qatar? Did we imprison the prime minister of another country? Are we bombing the hell out of the Arab Yemenis? What have we done in our region that we need to change? Just let me know. I mean, you talk about regional policies as if it is Iran that is making all these problems. I just mentioned a series of incidents over the past 40 years in which one Iran was responsible. Just give me one example. Did we pay Saddam Hussein $80 billion to use chemical weapons and other it's, uh, against his neighbor? Maybe, well, maybe what did we do? <clears throat> we defended ourselves. You know, we should, have, we should have simply lied down and played dead. That would have been nice for some. Our, our mistake is we didn't do that. We didn't support, you, you remember, I mean, people tend to be forgetful in the West. When Taliban announced a government in Afghanistan, who recognized that government? You remember? Do you remember? It was Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Pakistan. That these were the three countries, the only three countries in the world that supported, uh, recognized the Taliban. And what was Iran doing? Iran's diplomats, 11 of my colleagues were killed in Mazar-e Sharif by the Taliban. The first country that, whose people were killed by the Taliban were Iran. Who was behind 9-11? Did we send 15 of our citizens to bomb uh, the World Trade Center? What did we do? But then we became the axis of evil after 9-11. So just look, look at your history. When you're talking about regional policies. May, may, may I answer? Yeah, who, who supported the Iraqis to, to prevent Erbil from fa falling in the, in the hands of Daesh? Or to prevent Baghdad? Who went to the help of the Qataris? Minister, I think that uh, I have to stop you because this list could, could last for days. I'm yeah, but, but, but we if are accused of a regional the policy list. that is making the, no, the region it, unsafe. It's not at all an accusation, but precisely. <laughs> You have not mentioned Syria, for instance, in all this list. So I, you, did. So I did. I uh, did. Who, who supported Nusra 
and, uh, and Daesh in Syria. Okay. okay. Did we, we support them? But can I, can sure. I phrase my question on, on, on Syria? Yes, please. Okay. The thing is, you know, do you think that the main game changer in Syria was the Russian intervention, first? And second, what sort of, um, I would say, cooperation do you expect with uh, Russia in the, coming, uh, in the coming years, both politically and militarily? Well, uh, we work closely with Russia in Syria. Uh, we have our policy in Syria. The policy that we, we follow in Syria is that we see an existential threat not only against Iran, but against the entire region coming from these extremist organizations. And I think Russia sees the same. Some of our friends in the region, some of our neighbors in the region do not see this existential threat. They see other existential threats. This is what divides us. <coughs> but, but with Russia and now with Turkey, we believe that we need to do two things. We need to maintain Syria's territorial integrity, prevent people from partitioning Syria, and at the same time, fight terrorism. And try to do it by ending this conflict in Syria. I think the only policy that has worked in Syria is the Astana process. The only game in town that has worked, the only countries that could prevent a disaster in Idlib were Iran, Turkey, and Russia. And I think we are going to focus on this, and I hope the international community will help us. I hope the international community will support the political process that would help end the fighting in Syria. If the political process in Syria is intended to reverse the outcome on the ground, it will fail. The political process needs to bring inclusion to the process on the ground. It cannot reverse the situation on the ground. And Iran, Russia, and Turkey will help to bring that about, both within the uh, Astana process as well as through uh, working with uh, Stefan de Mistura and the United Nations. Minister, let me, let me just stay on Russia for a second because, uh, yes, obviously, uh, you were uh, all in the same uh, scenery uh, in, in Syria, but some pretend, and so I want to understand what you think, uh, that there in Syria, your relations with Russia became a little bit more chilly than it used to be. Something happened there. Did anything happen on the ground in Syria that we are not aware of and changed the balance between uh, Iran and Russia? Well, last time I took the temperature, it wasn't chilly. It wasn't chilly. <laughs> you can ask Sergei Lavrov when you see him tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to ask him. <laughs> and uh, uh, just give us uh, a, a little second about uh, uh, GCPOA and Europe. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, you will continue to stay in and to what extent and how much are you counting on Europe? Well. I did not spend two and a half years, basically day and night. People say John Kerry and I spent more time together during <laughs> those two and a half years than we spent with our wives. <laughs> we, I mean, and, and Federica Mogherini and other ministers, we did not, Sergei Lavrov and others, we, I mean, we spent a lot of time working on a very detailed document. Some people tell us, why don't you go to the negotiating table with the United States? I tell them, we, we did negotiate with the United States. It doesn't matter for a foreign government. It doesn't matter which administration you're negotiating with. You're negotiating with the country. We negotiated a very good deal. In my view, it doesn't respond to all of our needs. It doesn't respond to all of their needs. But that's the beauty of it. That's, that means compromise. We did, not make, we did not spend so much time to simply walk out of it. So it's our intention to keep the deal alive. And I believe it's the European intention to keep the deal alive. As I said, we rely on our people. And that is where the red line is. If our people believe that the deal is not conducive to their economic interest, then we will have to respond to the will of our people. But I believe the political will in Europe is there. We just need to combine that political will with the necessary action. Europe believes that JCPOA is in its security interest. I can assure you, my friends, you cannot swim without getting wet. You need to invest in your security. Come on. On that precisely, there was this... Um, what is it, 4402? Four I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Monica knows, but uh, 
We have four minutes. minutes. Yeah, okay, good. Still, still time for, for, for two, two questions, maybe. Yes, precisely on, on, the, on the EU, what do you expect right now from the EU, EU partners? And um, is it going in the, in the good direction, you know, this project of special purpose vehicle, or it's too limited? What, 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 what are your expectations right now from the uh, European capitals? Well, you see, I, what, what I said, if Europe believes that JCPOA is in its security interest, it has to be prepared to invest in its security. Now, Europe has made good political statements. I believe that has to be admired and complimented because it is important that Europe is making its views known in the international community on this issue, even if it means that it has to differ with its longtime ally. And we're not in the business of creating a wedge between Europe and the United States. We know that's uh, not... There is no need. Uh, I mean, it's not practical. It's not practical, and uh, that's not our, our intention. Our intention is we believe that this is in the interest of Europe, it is in our interest, and Europe should spend, uh, invest in it. Now, Europe made commitments uh, six months ago, and special purpose vehicle was not one of those commitments. Commitments was to an, allow Iran to continue to sell oil, to help Iran to uh, get the finances back, get, uh, I mean, investment, all sorts of stuff. Special purpose vehicle is a European design to address this. It's not our request, it is their design. And we don't know whether it will succeed or not. We don't know whether the private sector will uh, receive it positively. But don't you interpret it politically? as a wish to try to find a way to, to interact or to It to is, and, and that is what has kept JCPOA alive mm -hmm. up until now. Because we have seen the political commitment on the part of Europe, and as I said, there is no, uh, I mean, hurry in Iran to get out of JCPOA because we believe it's a good deal. And if I may, the very last question, even in uh, times of crisis, uh, we leave little room for discussions. Are you leaving any little room for discussion with the United States? Well, it depends on the United States. As I said, if we are to make an agreement with the United States, what is the guarantee that that agreement will last after the flight? You remember Canada? How, how, how are we to be confident that the signature will stay on the paper. We spent two and a half years. This is not a two-page document. This is not a picture opportunity, photo op. This is a 150-page document. Worked, word by word, by a lot of people, nuclear scientists, lawyers, finance people, sanctions people, on all sides. Now, why should we resume another talk just because somebody doesn't like it? Just because somebody hates his predecessor? I mean, that, that's not the reason you engage in diplomacy. Diplomacy is a serious game, and we are ready for a serious game. Thanks, uh, thanks, Minister Zarif. Uh, thanks for uh, being uh, back uh, to MED. And thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, you. Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Yes, Thank, Thank you, you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as we start the next session right now. Please remain seated.